Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Polland. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight, we welcome two important guests to talk about a critical topic. Election of judges is a time for reform in Texas. First, Judge, Judge, Judge Jeff Shadwick of the 55th District Court. Judge Shadwick is a Republican and his former colleague, no, never colleague, his former <laughs> opponent, they've run against each other twice, folks, Dion Ramos, a uh, Democrat and former judge of the 55th Judicial District Court. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. And you, you two guys actually like each other? Is, you know, is, is that what we're getting? Hey, well, you know, they say yes. politics may, makes strange bedfellows. <laughs> yeah, at least as far as you know, we like each other. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about the, the, kind of how, how we get here with, with you two, because it's actually a, it's a fascinating story. You're two outstanding lawyers. Nobody disputes that. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Shadwick gets selected by Governor Perry and appointed. In I'll tell it quick. I got appointed at the end of 2007. Uh, by law, you're required to run at the next available election, which, of course, was the Obama wipeout. So I got wiped out along with everybody else. My, mine was by Judge Ramos, and so he got the balance of the unexpired term, and so we had to run again in 2010, and this time I won. Because of Judge Ramos, this time the Obama reverse landslide. Well, yeah, you might call it that. The revenge of Rick Perry. <laughs> we could call it that. <laughs> I think it was just that the Judge Chadwick was so much more qualified than me that uh, the voters voted him in. <laughs> I, I actually think that in, in, in uh, neither election did either of our qualifications, <laughs> experience or aptitude, have the slightest thing to do with anybody's votes. Which I guess brings us to an interesting uh, first point to talk about. Yeah, that, that's what we're here to Ju talk about, I, I mean, think. Judges are probably the, the closest thing voters come to to elected officials. Wouldn't you all agree? Absolutely. Yeah, probably. No, I think I look at judges as the interface between, you know, government and society. And, uh, you know, I think people are, I tell people they're much more likely to interact with a judge than they are even the mayor, and certainly your congressman or your uh, president. So, you know, we're on the front line. Mm -hmm. So you're there and you're on a ballot. We're in Texas, one of, what, 15 states, David? You can vote straight ticket. Uh, and uh, as you said, Judge Chadwick, uh, you didn't win or lose because of anything you did. Yeah, it helps uh, when you lose that you don't have to take it personally, and it also helps when you run because you have to do almost nothing because everything is completely out of your control. So let's, help, let's talk about your calculations <clears throat> that were in your head when you're getting this notice that you're going to be appointed to a bench 2007. You know it's a presidential election in 2008. Didn't you have any reservations about taking that job, knowing full well what happens in presidential elections? Uh, not at all, because we thought that Hillary was going to be the candidate and we'd take, we'd take Harris County. And in fact, you know, until John McCain kind of got boneheaded in October, even that election looked okay. But once, once it became clear that there was going to be an Obama sweep, we got nervous. And you, Judge Ramos, did you, did you take advantage <clears throat> Of poor Mr. Shadwick with your, you know, special insight into who was going to win the Democratic primary? <laughs> well, uh, you know, people did call me an opportunist, but I deny that charge uh, fully. <laughs> no, I think uh, Jeff's right. I mean, you know, throughout 2008, I mean, the, if you recall, the campaign was swinging back and forth uh, so many times, and it really, uh, you know, it never really was a sure thing, and it just happened uh, that, uh, you know, in the end that uh, the uh, Obama won, and then it created some coattails, as we say, uh, here in Harris County. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know that you ever take a bench or run for a bench uh, because you never know. You just never know. Well, the history in Texas of voting for judges really, in a partisan way, took place because when you go back uh, originally, you'd have a handful of judges, maybe in many counties, just one judge. So the judge would become a very important elected official for everyone to be able to identify and know. In Harris County, we have how many elected judges? Uh, Fifty-nine. 59, district court judges. 59 district judges, Probably all the county 30. court judges, so maybe 100 with JPs mm -hmm. and the yeah. like. On this past ballot, there were 72 judges up. So it's pretty hard for the average voter to know who the heck they're voting for. The so. average lawyer doesn't know <laughs> more than two or three of the judges. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, <clears throat> I believe that she's on record as saying that she thinks the election of judges is a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> do you agree with her? <clears throat> Actually, I'm okay with it. Uh, having been the victim and then the beneficiary of a giant sweep. Though there's so many different levels to look at it. Should they be elected at all? If we're elected, should we be elected partisan? Should we be elected on the same day as others? You know, there seems like there are a lot of ways that you can go at this. But my experience from having started my law practice in another state is that there are problems even with um, other systems, like there's the Missouri plan. Gary, you're familiar with that. I practiced law up in Kansas where they did appoint and then retention elections. And, you know, there are, there are flaws and opportunities for abuse in just about every system, so I ended up kind of being okay with being elected. 
There was a, there's also an Iowa plan. And in Iowa recently, three Supreme Court justices who were part of a unanimous ruling saying that same-sex marriage was, you know, a constitutional matter, uh, were defeated by a group of people that said, you know, that's wrong. It's something else should govern and not your understanding of the Constitution. Uh, is that an, a good argument for not having an election of judges? Well, uh, as I understood the uh, Iowa plan, it was uh, a similar. To, it was a, a type of a Missouri plan where there was an appointment and then there were retention elections. And uh, what uh, happened in Iowa in 2010 was that a lot of special interest money uh, came into Iowa to defeat uh, these uh, justices who had been on the court that ruled in favor of uh, same-sex marriage, uh, and uh, they spent millions of eh, around a million dollars to uh, have them defeated. So the problem with that is even though you've got election or appointment and then retentions at the election of the, the next term, uh, now these special interests are starting to attack the retention. And what happens is you end up attacking the justice on their ideology or their ruling as opposed to whether or not they're fit to be judged or whether they've done anything wrong. Uh, so. Uh, that's where the problem comes in with with the what they call the election retention system. Okay, but the present system is, has got issues because we have good people that get beat when we have these sweeps that get to take place because of external events. Uh, in, in 2008, we lost a number of Republican like judges me. that were well respected. This time, we've lost some Democratic judges that are res well respected. Yeah, but Gary, good people get beat in every election, and I think I think the the reason that this comment comes up in judicial races instead of legislative, let's say, is because we are so much more anonymous. You know, you lose good state reps and senators, good congressmen, good city councilmen and women, whatever, in sweeps. And somehow people feel less anxiety about that. And I don't know if that's because <clears throat> you have more ability to influence your race on a, on a head-up race like that than, you know, when 72 judges are on the ballot. But I'm not sure that just because 72 judges are on the ballot that they deserve, we deserve any more sympathy than anybody else for being lost, even though we're good. Can an argument be made that Supreme Court judges, court, appellate court judges, should be removed from the ballot, given that that is where sometimes ideology and, and, and you know, sort of the values of a judge comes into play, as against you guys who are just calling <clears throat> balls and strikes overruled, sustained, you know? Uh, you, you can have the ballot. Let the other ones. You, you sound know. like my son. He, he claims there's no skill required at our level. So uh, <laughs> De Dion and I will argue with you about what level yeah. of ability the, is, it comes into the, a trial the, judge. The trial court's where the real action is. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, you're right. I mean, I think there is a, a, certainly a different uh, ideology that uh, is in play in uh, uh, appeals courts and Supreme Courts because they can make law there. Um, or, uh, but um, you know, it's like if you're going to do that for them, then why don't you do it for everybody? If you're going to have elections for the trial court judges, then have elections for everybody. Because the problem with any system that is not elected is that you run the risk of having uh, a minority of people make decisions, and uh, that doesn't seem to be a fair way well, to pick. Turn, turn the question around the other way, David. Why shouldn't the judiciary reflect the will of the people? And and when you when you turn it around that direction, I think instead of asking the question, oh gosh, aren't we losing good people, or aren't there sweeps, or something like that, it, it starts to make a little bit more sense to me at least that elections, uh, that judges remain on the ballot. And you ask the question, I'll answer it just because the will of the people sometimes ignores such things as the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> well, I think, you know, they I think, don't rule on individual cases. I, uh, I think the problem with the will of the people argument is that those. But many, many, many people that vote for the judges, especially in straight ticket voting, don't know who they're voting for. So you could argue that that's not the will of the people. Uh, and uh, I would also argue that the judiciary uh, is special in many ways, in that the judiciary uh, needs to be uh, independent. Uh, whereas with uh, uh, other elected officials, congressmen, uh, senators, you know, they have their own agendas uh, and, uh, and appropriately so. So you could argue that, that the judiciary needs to be treated. Well, could, could you preserve that by just having nonpartisan elections but still elect judges? Well, that's that's certainly uh, been proposed, uh, been pre-filed in this uh, legislative session, and uh, that is something that uh, is considered to uh, help solve the problem. Uh, yeah, I, I, 
I'm not going to weigh in on whether it's a good idea or not because I don't well, know. Well, that's one. The other one is to take it away from the straight ticket. You can't vote straight ticket uh, can't straight down through the judicial races. You have to go and vote individually. Yeah, and the other the other one I've heard that intrigues me a little bit is is perhaps having the judges elected on a different day, like in in May when the school bonds are up or something. You 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 would tend to you would think to get an electorate that was more directly interested in judicial races and perhaps more knowledgeable about judges. Uh, I, I personally would would uh, keep the system the way it is, but there are a lot of suggestions like that that I wouldn't oppose. It there still makes sense. I, th- I remember not too long ago there was a, I think it was Senator Ellis here had a bill that would have had judges, district judges running in state senate districts. You know, you'd be so many Senate districts, you just divide them up and you have maybe 7, 8, 10, 12 per Senate district putting putting people closer to the voters so that there's not so much partisan swings. I mean, that's yeah, I, that makes sense, doesn't it, Gary? No. no. I, I don't. I don't I <laughs> that was all designed at the point he came up with it, David, to elect Democratic judges by putting them in Democratic <laughs> senatorial districts. Yeah, that's I, all that was. I, I personally Before the like, Democrats actually I won. personally don't like that one too much because... It 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 uh, it skews the this branch of the government into a position where you become or you may feel more like a representative, and um, and I think that that takes away from the judicial function too much. You don't you don't want to have constituents. Uh, judge Ramos, is it is it difficult for for a judge to wear the two hats of, of both politician and judge? I because mean, those are significant roles in our society. Well, yeah, I think that that's. Uh, uh, certainly a consideration. Uh, uh, I think it, uh, uh, I don't know that it's difficult, but uh, you have to be careful because that's what uh, politics is all about is constituents, uh, whereas uh, when you're uh, acting as a judge, uh, you know, you have to follow the law and you have to be even-handed and fair and, and all those things. So uh, it is difficult uh, if uh, you're put in a position of having to make decisions based on your political future. Uh, I guess that's the good thing about having uh, judges elected uh, in, uh, more or less anonymously because they, they people don't know that much about them is that they aren't really beholden to one particular uh, ideology or another. So we could have no partisan ballot for the judges. We could actually have term limits for judges, say three, four-year terms and you're out. And uh, let's have uh. a pay, in, <laughs> pay increase, have a pay <laughs> increase to attract, uh, you know, the most talented lawyers that we can find. Well, and there's a solution to the problem. I would suggest one 12-year term. <laughs> one <12-year. laughs> That's right. Just, just enough to vest in the, in the, in the uh, pension. <laughs> well, what about that? I mean, you know, that, but, but if you don't want to, maybe there aren't any solutions. So let's talk about the mechanics of electing. Uh, and you both were in these campaigns of 2008, 2010. How did you raise money to support your campaign? And did you just, or did you just turn over that to your political party and say, hey, do your best for me. <laughs> That's funny. Well, the parties locally don't raise money for the candidates. Uh, the, the, the parties only want get, money from candidates. That's right. The parties want money from candidates. <laughs> your, your party, too, huh? Oh, yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I ran as the incumbent in, in 2008, um, you know, I did the fundraisers with the law firm, raised money, spent everything I had, and it had no impact at all, and I lost. I worked my head off. In 2010, I raised almost no money. Uh, by on purpose, I didn't have a fundraiser, uh, just a, a, a smallish one, so I could chip into the pot. We all contributed to a pot. I attended almost nothing in one big. So, and the lawyers love you because you didn't ask them for any money. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fixing to. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Judge Ramos, the same question to you, and put it in another way: as you look to what's happening in 2012, when all of your Democratic colleagues that were elected with you in 2008 will be up again. As we know, incumbent judges can raise money, you know, as Jeff proves, <laughs> the challengers cannot. So would you say that there's an edge that the Democratic uh, judges have, the incumbents have, going into the 2012 election cycle? Well, uh, generally speaking, I would say yes. Uh, the, uh, in the 2010 election, though, I wouldn't uh, ex- expect that any amount of money that was either spent by the Republicans made any difference for them. Right. And we certainly know that any amount of money spent by Democrats didn't make any difference for them. So, you know, I'm not sure really that raising money and spending money uh, can make a difference uh, in judicial races. I think everybody uh, would agree that, you know, I mean, it was pretty close in 2010. It was less than 1% 
difference in the vote. Maybe at that level you can make a difference, but at the levels of the voting in 2010, there was no amount of money that was going to make any difference. So, you know, they could, you're right, they could raise a lot of money. Uh, this time the Republican judges were the incumbents. They had a lot of money. They spent a lot of money. But did they really move the needle? Any. I don't think they did. Of course, you don't know uh, how elections going to turn out when it starts, as you recited Absolutely. what happened in 2008 and was back and forth. And likewise, in 2010, it wasn't apparent, I guess, till September that the Democrats faced disaster and at the polls nationally and it was going to impact Texas. So that's interesting in, in terms of how that works. So in some instances, there have been cases where how much money is spent in a local campaign does make a difference. Yeah, and there were so many judges running this time, 72 of us, that you could, you could look at the swing between the top and bottom vote getters on each side and go back, as so many of the political junkie judges have done, and figure out which ones got the of this endorsement, but not that one. Which ones bought radio or didn't buy radio? And as you go up and down the list, um, it's it's pretty hard to find any consistent rule for why somebody finished at the top or why why somebody finished at the bottom. Katie Kennedy, for example, was the highest Democrat vote getter. I think because she was a very popular and very good judge uh, some years ago, but her spread between the bottom vote getter for the Democrats wasn't really explainable by any amount of money spent or anything else other than just what you might expect to see from a former judge running. So, Well, you, you're, you're in touch with voters, you, even though you say, you, 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 as you, in your case, you just sat back and, and, and watched, yeah. uh, but you have been out there. You have spoken to thousands of people, as has Judge Ramos. What does the public think about <clears throat> electing you? Are they happy with it? And, and, and how much <clears throat> of a consideration should that be? Dion, my, my experience was is that uh, in this particular election, it was all scoreboard. Uh, Republicans all over Harris County just wanted to beat Democrats. They wanted to win. They wanted to take back the county. I could have been a judge. I could have been a dog catcher. Um, there was some resonance uh, with, with the notion of, look, if, if, if we're going to be a conservative party, if, if you want to support the Tea Party or whatever somebody was motivated to do, you have to understand that that stuff plays out in the courthouse just like it does in the state house, and so don't forget your judges. But it was still just about scoreboard, as far as I saw. And we had a historic uh, straight ticket vote. Right, it was yeah. incredible. I think to answer the question, uh, that when you go out and meet people, and, and the people you meet uh, certainly are happy to elect judges, and they're the people that are out there meeting the judges and talking to the judges and wanting to get to know them. But the problem is, is that... Uh, number one, as a candidate, it's physically impossible to meet enough people to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like, you know, you're running for president or anything and thousands of people show up to, to meet you. Uh, so you've got those people on both sides who really care and want to find out about the judges. But the problem is meeting or, or getting exposed to enough people to make a difference is, is how, difficult. How many events did you go to where the candidates outnumbered the voters? Well, that, that was typical. Well, there you, <laughs> you have two constituencies. You have the voters, you know, in your primaries and the like. You also have lawyers who know who you are and know how you behave and know how you rule, and they are frequently asked to take sides as well. So the question I have for you now is, does the public think that you're on the take because you receive money from lawyers who want something from you? I, I, I don't know. My law practice started out in the 80s around the area, era of the 60 Minutes show about the Texas Supreme Court. I don't remember the justice's name now. Gary, I'm sure you do. Justice didn't. for Sale, I think, was the yeah, title yeah. of the show. Uh, my sense is that we've moved beyond that a little bit. Um, but I'm not sure what the public thinks. You know... It, I suppose it's like anything else. Who else but the lawyers would be the people most concerned about the courts and therefore most interested in making sure who they think would be the best judge would get in? So that lawyers provide 95 to 100 percent of our campaign money probably isn't surprising. At least it shouldn't be. Um, but what, how the public perceives it, I, I'm not sure. Well, the public, when they, I tell you, when the public looks at and talk about campaign finance, there's a generally, I guess, a rebuttable assumption when dealing with politicians that large donors get better treatment than non-donors. Okay, that's just, I think, people feel that way. Yeah, probably. And so if you translate that into judges, the theory would be uh, larger lawyer donors get better treatment than uh, smaller lawyer donors. Some, of, In fact, I've had clients who've actually looked up how much the lawyer on the other side had given to the judge and then called me and said, well, do you think we got a problem here uh, with this judge? And I typically say, no, I don't think we do. 
happened. I yeah. don't think you remember. I think you're right, like, right. <laughs> but they were, but they looked. So yeah. Yeah, Judge Ramos. Yes, sir. Um, what about a reform that would say if there are two lawyers in your court or Jeff's court, and one of them gave substantial amount of money. Come up with a figure. Thousand dollars. Say five thousand is the maximum. All right, all right. <laughs> then, and then shouldn't that lawyer on the other side be able to raise an objection to Judge Shadwick hearing his case and have a guarantee that his that case is going to be moved and recycled and he would get another judge? Well, so far uh, those uh, objections have not been sustained by the courts. Uh, in Texas, we have a voluntary uh, limit on campaign contributions to judges is 5000 per person and I think uh, 30000 per law firm. Now, those are voluntary. Uh, what we saw in the uh, Caperton case, the U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, was that, you know, one side financed uh, a huge campaign to the tune of about $3 million in a statewide uh, Supreme Court race. I think the same thing would happen here and is that anybody who has donated over the $5,000 limit would be uh, subject to scrutiny at least uh, in terms of uh, Donating, you know, money to that judge's campaign, but I didn't, I didn't know you the, could. You could what? Oh, you can do it. That's just voluntary. You can. Sure, do I got to call some people back. Yeah, you know? <laughs> no, I didn't, have, I didn't have any lawyers give me five thousand or even scratch close to that number. Look, um, how about the party that's in a dispute where these two lawyers, in, in my hypothetical, shouldn't that party uh, have some confidence that uh, you know that contributions you know not going to have any impact on the decision that you might be uh, yeah sure and um, you know rule number one I think is literally world rule number one is that we shouldn't do anything to um, we should avoid even the appearance of impropriety and um, and so there, there's been a lot of struggling over the years about whether accepting a campaign contribution gives that appearance and I think just because we have elected judges, you, you sort of have to say no or else you have to change your whole system. That would be um, true. <clears throat> I'm, I, I'm, I practiced law 31 years. I never once felt like I, I could discern any um, uh, effort by a judge to, to manipulate a case towards somebody who had given a large contribution. And, and maybe that's because I don't think I ever once looked up what my opponent had given mm -hmm. a judge. So. Uh, well, I think it's an understandable concern, especially from the outside, but on the inside, I just, I can't recall it ever coming up. And so think, the courthouse is honest, is, uh, in your opinion. I, I, the I the Harris County Courthouse, is it honest? I think so. I think uh, so, too. And the reason is, is that, uh, you know, if somebody gives a large donation and they have an untenable position, you know, I don't, the judge just cannot make that ruling. I mean, he could, but he will be quickly, you know, mandamus or reverse. So, you know, I just don't see that that plays into the decision-making process. Yeah. I agree. Well, David. Well, the law, though, is at at risk here, is it not? If the if the public sees that these sorts of shenanigans are is going on, I mean, you know, there is you know, people want this is our argument for not having elected judges. They want to know that the law matters more than your uh, ambitions. Well, that that's a I guess that's a legitimate concern, but that's sort of the point I was leading towards uh, earlier about alternative methods. Let's say we aren't elected, but we're appointed. Um, it might become interesting how many uh, prospective judges had given to the governor's campaign then, or, or the, the governor's Ooh, advisory committee question. might be made up of people who are, have people in their law firm who want to get appointed. I mean, the, the, the effort to manipulate um, as you move up the chain towards the governor's office, if you think about it, gets ever smaller. And so it's more likely to avoid impropriety and to have openness, to have the, the selection process to be as far from that office as possible, which is which would be the case for a lot David, that's a quite compelling argument against <laughs> appointed retention. Well, and since there's never going to be a Democratic <laughs> governor, Judge Ramos, I guess we have to be against the... <laughs> well, you know, that's the, uh, that's the issue. Uh, if uh, the governor or some panel that's uh, appointed by the governor or somehow um, controlled by the governor uh, is making the appointments, then yeah, you know, you, you don't, you know, there never would have been any Democratic judges in Harris County in 2008. Uh, you know, the thing that, that all of these systems uh, need to uh, encourage is judicial independence. And anytime you've got any, uh, if there's any allegiance to a donor, if there's any allegiance to a party, uh, if there is something that you have to do as a judge, like pledge, you know, a certain oh. ideology to get a party's nomination. Right. Then all of those things uh, uh, will will erode judicial independence, and that's what we need to worry about. Because you're right, 
the public's perception of the judiciary is the most important because they need to have uh, faith in the system that in, that it works. And 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 David, um, if if being appointed by the governor was subject to uh, and and this particular governor, let's talk about Governor Perry because he's been there long enough to appoint a lot of judge judges. If there was a problem, I, it would have come up by now. I mean, he's made so many appointments, and Gary, you're you're an attorney. If you think about the appointments that he's made. They've all been good lawyers and good judges. I mean, if there was a if there was a glaring problem, then I would feel worse about moving away from elections and towards an appointment. So we're routine. lucky we have Governor Perry, David. It, uh, you know, I hate to close the show with uh, Judge per Rick, Rick Perry getting uh, the <laughs> the best of the argument. We we have to thank you, Judges Ramos and Chadwick, for being with us. Thank you. Thank it was you. fun. Thank you. We invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Click on the local program bar, red, white, and blue. Read about the guests. Watch the follow-up discussion with Gary if you must. And until next time, get informed and get active. <laughs>